everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card for tomorrow, um, September 17th. And I am glad that I waited until now to uh, to do this. Uh, number one, because one of the fights got canceled. And secondly, it really gave me an, uh, a chance to digest kind of industry content, uh, see some weigh-ins and, and, and all of that. And I will say this. This is one of the, the best DFS cards I've ever seen. And when I say best, I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult. I mean, it's really hard. But there are so many options okay um you could make a case now there are 26 fighters i mean for 25 of them maybe um maybe 24 so what you have to do if you wanted to play gpps for example even if you want to play 150 you are just going to have to take stands somewhere you know you can't just play everybody you can't just get 10% of everybody and you are going to have to take stands and you're going to have to take stands against some good plays. Okay. The other thing is that the ownership is sort of spread out. So it's not so easy to say, well, this is going to be the lowest owned of these because they're all going to be, you know, get some degree of ownership except for a couple of exceptions. So what I do want to do is I want to go through these, through this card um and we'll go fight by fight and then at the end actually as we get through it i will tell you where what stands i'm taking because you are going to have to take some but there are so many fights here where the underdog either has grappling upside or ko upside um that listen, listen when i first did my builds earlier this week you know what i did there were literally six fighters or five fighters with grappling upside and i just put them all in a lineup and then I set rules that I want min four, min three, and whatever. And I want to see what that looked like. You know, that's one of the cool things you can do with 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 a slate like this is play like that. Um, so let's get started. And right off the bat, you know, with this Moda Van Camp fight, you already have, and this has not been talked about too much. I mean, you've you've heard some talk about Van Camp having you know, upside that he's bigger. He might even have some takedown upside, but not much. And that, you know, Moda has been very, very low volume, which is true. I've heard every take from Moda is, has low volume. So Moda is just bad, you know? And um, I actually did watch the Van Camp fight against, uh, uh, that he got knocked out. And the, the comments that he was winning or that he was, that he staggered uh, Fialo is a little bit, misleading i mean he really didn't but but that's okay because the fact of the matter is is that the the, the money line is such that already he's a good price without even having the finish upside so i mean let's look at this i mean he is only a plus 160 underdog and he's 6900 okay that already gives him money line value you know and, and moda as a minus only a minus 180 or minus 190 at, at 9300 makes him an atrocious play okay with with the exception of if, if you if you you know if, if he can get a finish so so we look at these at the inside the distance lines and you have a strong inside the distance line of minus 250 but look at the way it breaks down you get you have um What's his name? You have Moda winning inside the distance as plus 120 or minus 165. So it's somewhere in the middle of there. So it's about a 140 dog. But you even get Van Camp inside the distance at about plus 300 or so. Um, so right off the bat, you have a very live dog. Just first of all, just from the money line perspective. And then if you get some kind of, you know, finish upside or take down upside even that that only adds to it the one issue that you're going to have with picking these underdogs is that the way the slate shapes up i think is you're going to not just need to win i mean you're really going to need a score so it's not enough to say you have money line value on a slate like this um you are going to need more upside um does his inside the distance prop his submission prop and that equate to enough upside 
I think it does. So I do think right off the bat, I think one of the stands you could take, and this is ugly because, you know, your, your, your night can be dead in like one shot, is you could full fade mono. I mean, I have no interest in this. I mean, it's literally everything you don't want. You know, and, and don't kid yourself, you know, with with with, with the presence of, a, of some a lot of good looking underdogs on the slate, Moda will get played. You know, it's not like Moda is going to be 10 percent owned. I, I mean, I right now. In my ownership projections, I have Moda. At where is he? I have him at 18 percent ownership. Right. And that's that's not trivial. And if you play zero of him, for example, you're you're ahead of me. And I have Van Camp at about fifteen percent, um, and I think it makes sense given his 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 uh you know the money line uh, equity that he presents. Um, so right off the bat, I do think Van Camp is certainly the play there, and he is one. He is a decent long shot, a decent underdog. I think they're might they're better, but I think they're decent. Um, and the reason why they're better long shot plays is that. I do think that the 9K and up range is, could be somewhat fishy in general, which means that these mid-range plays might be better than these than these total punts. But we'll, we'll look at it. So the next one, you have Tony Gravely against Javid Basharat. And this is another one. This is a pure like win condition play. You have Tony Gravely, who is a plus 140 or something like that. Um his price is fine, 7,600. That's probably what he should be, maybe a little bit higher. But the thing is, is that his win condition is so conducive to high DraftKings scoring. That being the fact that he's a he's a very he's a very aggressive wrestler. And if in fact he gets what he wants, he could score, you know, let's just say a lot, <laughs> uh, even in 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 a decision. Um so when you have a 7,600 fighter with that type of grappling upside, where his entire win condition is predicated on the combination of that and um, uh, and maybe some KO upside as well. I mean, this is a, an elite DraftKings play, you know? Is it going to win? I mean, you know what? He's going to lose most of the time. <laughs> He's a 160 underdog. He's going to lose, you know whatever, 46% of the time, something like that, 55% of the time. But when he wins, he just rates the score in a really, really, you know, uh, a, a very DraftKings-friendly amount. How about that? Um, now, when you look at Basharat, now we have to kind of think about the, the win condition, right? Because while Gravely, while Gravely's – Upside, in other words, his win condition automatically gets him a good DraftKings score. At 8,600, you got to be a little more careful with Basharat because let's take a look at, at, at the inside the distance stuff with Basharat. So, so he, the odds on him to win inside the distance, they're giving you, um, it's like minus, so he's about a 180. 170 underdog to finish at 8600 that's like okay but not great one thing i will say is that basharat he might have some grappling upside of his own but it's hard to imagine that he's going to get the better of of gravely in 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 the in the wrestling okay he might get a submission on him or something like that and that's part of that inside the distance prop but I think at 8,600, I'm going to want either a better inside the distance prop or just more grappling upside. Now, you could make the case that if Gravely comes in really high owned, that Basharat makes sense because of the pivot, because it's a, you know, you get leverage. But I don't know how this is possible. I currently only show Tony Gravely, Gravely getting 22% ownership. And, and, it goes to show you like how many other good plays there are on the slate. I mean, this type of play on a normal 12 game slate would be like 30% of it. Okay. These are exactly the types of underdogs that you want to play. And everybody would just pound pounding this, but I guess because there's so many other plays, um, you know, he's, he's 
only rating, at least for me, to be 22% over. But we'll, we'll take a look and see if maybe they're, they're better. But for now, I would say Basharat would be more of a fade. Um, and again, we're trying to take stands here because if you did, otherwise I'm telling you, I could end up recommending 24 fighters. So, so far we have fade Moda, fade Basharat, uh, and then play Van Camp and Greywood. Zell Huber against Ogden. Um, so this is the second largest favorite on the board uh, at three minus three fifty, but it's not enough to get you know to have uh, to have uh, a, a good win odds. You know you really need to be able to put a, a score up. Um, I mean he's ninety four hundred. You know, I mean ninety four hundred. You're going to need to do a lot better. So so you need a really strong inside the distance line or grappling upside. And I don't see any evidence of incredible grappling upside. And when you look at the inside the distance prop, you have Zell Huber winning inside the distance, like plus 110. So he's an underdog to, to finish inside the distance. 9,400, that's kind of rough, you know? And 9,400, you want... You know, at that type of price, you want to be favored at least to finish inside the distance or and or, you know, ideally you get both. And to be able to get a lot of wrestling and ground and pound action, you know. Um, Trey Ogden, I was really close to making the case that you could play him as a underdog because, I mean, he does have some some submissions in his repertoire and you could argue that he does have some wrestling, but his money line is so poor that just the odds of him winning, you know what I mean? It's just not good enough to access those, you know, that upside. Right. I mean, only if you're a three to one underdog, that means you lose 25% of the time. So 25% of the time, so 25% of the time he's going to win. And even it's not so easy to just make sure to, to say, okay, so 25% of the time is in the optimal. It's not so easy, you know, because maybe he wins an ugly decision or something like that. His path is not as clear as some of these other underdogs like gravely, for example. Okay. So for me, I think this entire fight is probably a fake. Um, Jillian Robertson against Maria Agapova. Well, for my money, this is almost too easy. So it's probably going to lose. But 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 you have a perfect style matchup for a very big DraftKings score. Okay. So Jillian Robertson is not a good striker, but she's really, really strong. Um when it's grappling and when she gets the fight to the mat and she's in top control. Okay. Those, those, those conditions, when she does that, she submits people. She gets a lot of fantasy points. Uh, and on the other hand, you have Maria Agapova who, who's, whose weakness is exactly that, you know, being taken down and submitted. Okay. And when you have the, the two styles that match up just like that, and you have, okay, so she's a minus 150 favorite. She's not going to win all the time. But I think it's safe to say that of the 60% of the time she wins, right? Because, you know, if you're minus 150, you win about 60% of the time. That she's going to get a good score. Like, a, I mean, a lot. Let's put it that way. And she's only 8,400. You know? So for me, I mean, Jillian Robertson is, a is a, again, a, an elite play on this slate. Um, as far as Agapova goes, the only thing I would say about her is is she's she's a GPP type of fighter because she is she is just I mean I don't want to cancel for saying this she's like a stone psycho okay she if you go back I mean she was when she was um gonna fight Sab Sab uh, Sabina uh, Mazo she was 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 almost homeless like like flocking from camp to camp getting kicked out of camps and, and posting on her Instagram that she wasn't in a good way. And in that fight, I mean, everybody was all over the Sabino Mazo side in the, um, in DFS and Sabino Mazo was supposed to take her down the whole thing. 
And I only didn't play the fight that much because I thought there was a real chance that, that Agapova wouldn't show up, you know, like after, after the fight lot, but I did play Mazo and I'll tell you this, Agapova basically tooled on her the whole time. I mean, she kicked her ass the whole fight. And, and so she does have that in her. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't kill you if you played a little bit of the other side as well, because and Agapova is not going to get it. I'm telling you, she's not going to get a decision this way. If she wins, it's going to be because Jillian Robertson could not get her down and Agapova went, went freaking ham on her. Okay. Um, so I think that Jillian Robertson is super elite. And I think that Agapova's in play as well at 77. Luma Lukbumi against Denise Gomez or Gomes. Um, Luma Lukbumi is 9,500. And she's only two to one to win. And she has a very poor inside the distance prop. And she doesn't have grappling upside. So uh, that is uh, all the recipe for a bad play. Um, she is going to be, I would imagine, the lowest owned fighter on the oh, second lowest owned fighter on the slate. Um, so you could make the argument that you have leverage if, you know, if Gomes comes in and just walks into a shot and gets KO'd and, and you know, whatever. And as a matter of fact, I've seen so much in the past special six weeks about when I would say, okay, I'm playing everybody on the slate except for these two people. And those two people break the slate. I mean, it happened last week. I didn't play first at Ziam or, or Quinones. And I don't remember if that was the same card. Yeah. That was two cards ago. I didn't play any Quinones or Ziam and those two broke the slate, you know? So maybe I should play it. Maybe I should flick in a look for no, I mean, she's going to be 5% owned. And if Gomez is just atrocious and somehow gets clipped in, in, in the first minute, I mean, how cool are you? So I don't know. Maybe I will play a little of that. It's certainly not a good play, okay? But um, uh, so that's that. Um, Gomes at, what, she's 7K? She's priced sort of fairly, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not playing her. All right. Fight canceled, fight canceled, fight canceled. Now you have Trevin Giles against Louis Cose. Um, you have another two to one fight, and it's priced uh, a little saucy, right? You have you have Giles, what is he, 9,200? 9,100 versus Cose, 7,100. So it's priced about right. You look at the inside the distance prop, and at 9,100, you're going to want Giles to be favored to finish inside the distance or have grappling upside. And if you look at it, you have Giles. It's it's almost the exact play as, uh, well, it's even a, it's a little better because of the price, but as Zilhober, uh, Zilhober, whatever his name was, remember uh, the plus 110 to finish? Is that the same as, uh, as Zell Huber? Let's see. Um, Zell Huber. Inside of this, yeah, it's exactly the same. Okay, it's a better play, I think, than Zell Huber because Zell Huber's 9,400, right? And um, and uh, and Giles is 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 9,100, so he has that going for it. Um, so I guess it's fine. And I also have I have heard the case made that he has grappling upside as well. Um, I haven't seen it myself, but maybe. So Giles, I think, is kind of an okay 9K play, but certainly nothing nothing amazing. Um, and Kose is is kind of your prototypical punt play because from what from what I see, you look at his inside the distance prop, he's plus four to one to finish uh to, to finish him. And more to the point, I've heard it argued that. Most of his upside is inside the first round. So is he going to win? No, probably not. But if he does, right, and, and it happens probably about 20% of the time, maybe a little less, that the first round KO is most is the most likely result of his win. So of those 20%, he's going to score really well. So that brings him, it, even though you don't think he's going to win, that brings him into play. Um, so for me, I think that both of these fighters are sort of in play. 
Um, Koshi definitely, and maybe some Giles. But as I'm mentioning, the uh, the sub nine Ks might be better. We'll we'll see. Um, Pat Sabatini against Damon Jackson. So you have Pat Sabatini is a two to one favorite, and he gets all of his um, points and all of his action because of his aggressive wrestling style. Um, and it seems to me that this should be a really strong play, you know, and, and this is, this is one that at the beginning of the week I was all over and then content has just talked me off of this this week. I've heard so many takes about how, Damon Jackson is going to stuff the takedowns. And Damon Jackson has good grappling himself. And Sabatini shouldn't be two to one. And Sabatini's been wrestling against much weaker guys and, and all this stuff. But you know what hasn't changed? The odds. It's, 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 Sabatini's holding nice and firm at two to one, you know? So it's not as if this line is bad. Um, so now we're back to the point of. You have a guy whose win condition is predicated upon him doing doing work in the grappling. I would prefer at 9,100 to have more than that, though. Like, I would prefer to have, you know, grappling along with a lot of ground and pound, like Romanoff or something like that, or um, like St. Denis, like guys that we know are going to just try to ground and pound as well. Because Sabatini is more of a wrestling and then just kind of control you type of dude. He's really not much of a finisher either, you know? So while I feel as though he's a good play, he's not like an elite play, okay, uh, given his price. So I definitely think he's in play. I think he's a very similar – Not as a, he's a different type of play than Giles, but I think that they're both, you know, I think they're both in play. Let's put that. Um, so – Anthony Hernandez versus Mark Andre Burial. So this one is probably the best play on the slate. It's not my my stand. I'm gonna get into that. I mean, here you have a first of all, you have minus two 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 to one and change, right? And instead of being ninety one hundred like some of these other cats at the same price, uh, same odds, um. Hernandez is only 8,700. I mean, that's kind of a, a, a joke if you think about it. You know, all those other two-to-ones were 9,100, 9,200, whatever it is. You're getting a $400 discount on him. But not only that, his win condition is 100% DraftKings gold. I mean, he loves to pressure, loves to wrestle, loves to take down, and, you know, all that combines to be, I guess, the best play on the slate. You know what I mean? Like, I I put his winning chance, his scoring chances. Like, if I were doing my own projections, I would project him higher than Sabat Sabatini. I would project him higher than Giles. I would project him higher than Luke Boomy. I would project him higher than um, what's his name? Than Zoll Huber. You know. I think this is – I'd certainly project him higher than Moda. He's got just as good of a winning chance as all those other dudes and gals, and yet his price is – excuse me, and his win condition is just the nuts. Does he have finishing upside? Who knows? Maybe, but that's not the – I'd almost, I'd almost rather him not finish. The more rounds, the more control time, the more takedowns, he could get 120 when he's, this is all said and done. You know? So for me, Fluffy Hernandez, Anthony Hernandez is is looking. He's also going to be the highest stone. He just has to be. That, you know, it's not in the main event. But I don't know if I want to fade that. I mean, you fade that. See, here are the guys I don't think you could fade. Like if you fade Hernandez, and you fade, you know, uh, what's his uh, Julian Robertson, and you fade uh, Gravely, those three fighters can score one ten plus. Without a without a finish, you know, and that breaks the slate at those prices, you know. So so be be careful about getting too cutesy with these guys. I mean, if you bet against these, if you don't use them, it's because you think they're going to lose. You know what I mean? And and listen, they are going to lose some of the time, 
But Hernandez is going to win 67% of the time, pretty much. With his scoring, I mean, look, this is this is the way it goes. All right, so Tanner Bozer versus Rodrigo Nascimento. This is another one. This is striker versus grappler. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I will say that it's striker versus someone who might be a grappler. Uh, I, I've, I've heard varying takes on whether Nascimento actually can wrestle, <laughs> actually has grappling upside. Um. I, I think it might be somewhat fraudulent. Let's just take a look at the pricing first. You have Bozer is a minus 180. So he should probably be, what do we say, like 8,900 or something like that. So this should be 8,900, 7,300, 8,800, something like that. What is the price? The price is, uh, where is it? Where's the, where's the, where's the fight? Um, why can't I see it? Because I'm an idiot. Where did it go? Oh, uh, what's, what's going on here? Did I pass up by it like 30 times? Wait, what? Oh, Bozer. So he's 8,800. That's pretty fair. You know, no great shakes either way. And I'm, I'm kind of inclined to to probably call bullshit on the Nascimento wrestling upside. Um, if I play 150, I'll probably grab some, but it's probably bullshit. Um, now, with respect to Bozer, he's got an inside the distance prop. Well, he's plus 140 to KO. And that probably puts him at about a pick him inside the distance. No, he's plus 130 inside the distance. So I think that's fair. You know, I don't think it's great at 87, 8,800, but I think it's fair. But with the absence of any any real wrestling upside too, I don't know. I guess he's a fringe play. I guess it's all right with, that, with just that finishing upside. I guess it's okay. I guess, I guess both these guys are just okay. But they're certainly not priorities, and there's certainly nothing I want to take a stand on. Um, all right, so Joe Pfeiffer versus Alan Amadovsky. Um, you have the biggest favorite on the card, who's minus 450. And um, you have an inside the distance prop where he's an enormous favorite to finish him uh, inside the distance. He's minus 250 to finish the guy inside the distance. I mean, you realize how, what a big deal that is. Like, how much better that is than these other fighters that were less expensive. Now, yeah, he's 9,700. And those other guys are 92, 93, 94, whatever. But you think about it with with the with the existence of these underdogs on the slate that are really playable. I mean, the ninety seven hundred price tag may may seem like a lot because you know we just are not used to seeing it. But think about all those times where we had guys with a really really good inside the distance prop like that, and and they were ninety three hundred, and we said you know if there were dynamic pricing, this guy would really be like ten k or something like that. Well, now they're finally making this guy probably what he should be. If, in fact, he rates to finish the guy probably in the first round, I mean, why shouldn't he be 9,700? You know, what? why make this guy 9,200 so people could just jam him in? Why don't you make him 9,700? Make it kind of a decision. So um, I think it's a perfectly fair price for him. Um, and, you know, I think he's completely in play. That's the best I can describe it. He's going to – he's the he's – the, he's the, He's the one most likely on the score, the slate to score 100. Uh, that's that's doesn't take a genius to, to to say that, but but you know that's that line of demarcation. You know you, you want at least 100 from all your fighters, at least on a card like this. So I think he's uh perfectly playable. Um, and you have Amadovsky, who's just who's just uh, kind of hopeless. I mean, I don't play plus three sixties. You just you just you, you that's the. And I think his price is actually his prices might be fair here, you know. Um, and a minus as a plus three eighty, he might be fair here. Like some of these, like plus like six hundreds or something, like they should be like five k, right? Um, I guess this is a fair price, and and I guess if you do the math, if you look at his inside the distance prop, his inside the distance prop is pretty much the same as his 
is his win prop. I mean, he's not winning a decision here. I guess that's that's the import of this. I mean, he's plus 600 to win by TKO, and all that's almost his actual odds to win the fight, right? So the good thing is, is that if you play a smidge of, of Amadowski, from a math perspective, it's probably okay because he's going to be 0% of 5% owned. And in his wins, you're very happy. Let's put it that way. Um, so you could sprinkle him if you want. Not a priority, but you could sprinkle him. And uh, I obviously think that uh, that Pat Pfeiffer is a, is a very strong player. I mean, especially considering, I mean, you look at some of the of, of, of the guys that we identified already. I mean, I don't have to build the lineup for you, but you could build a lineup really easily. A pretty good high upside lineup with, with what we've been going over by now. We're not even at some of the other good stuff here. Um, so we have three more fights. Um, now this next one, you have Andre Feely versus Bill Algio. And you have basically a pick em fight. Actually, Feely is like a minus 130. He's priced pretty much like he should be, 8,300, 7,900, whatever it is. And you look at the inside the distance prop, and it's um, it's all right. I mean, it's not, it's not great. Um, mm -hmm. Feely winning inside the distance plus three hundred, not 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 the best, but so this is going to be the fight where I I I take kind of a stand here. Um, I'll tell you, I've absorbed a lot of content, I've seen a lot of takes, I've seen a lot of people, both DFS and betting people, whatever it is. And one thing I will say is that well, two things. First of all. Feely has not exactly the same to not ex, to not exactly the same degree, but pretty close. A similar grappling wrestling upside condition as some of these other guys that we talked about. If you look at his game log, he has he has history of taking of taking people down. Okay, let's let's look through this for a minute. Now again, it's not the best, but. And to some degree, you have to go back, but you, you look through this, and, and going back to like 2017, he took a dude down five times. This guy's good, but low above. He took down Bermudez four times. He took this guy down twice. Okay, then he took down Yusuf three times. He got five takedowns on Charles Jourdain. He's not the greatest takedown guy in the world, but five takedowns on Charles Jourdain. Then he fought Bryce Mitchell, and he has no hope of taking down Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell's a freaking superstar. Then he was against he was against the uh, 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 Pineda. He took him down, and he was winning. But then it was declared a no contest. I think because of an eye poke or something. And then look, he got starts by Brito. He got caught. It happens. All right. Against you know Bill Algio, who who just can't stop being taken down. I mean, like he we talked about this last week or last time he fought. We fought Herbert Burns and. And, and, and Algio was, was a favorite, and we said if he could just survive that first round, he should probably take over. And, and I tell you, it was a sweat, man. Um, Burns was just all over him, you know? Um, and and I can only imagine if, if he finished him, what the, what the odds of a fight like this would be. You know, it turns out he came back and whatever it is. And you know what other people are looking at? They're also saying, well, this guy, you know, Feely lost by KO to Brito and Algio. He, he, he beat him in the decision. You know, what, what are we doing here? What we're doing here is not playing MMA math. You know, this is a style issue that I think that Feely can really exploit. And, and when I say I think he can, he's going to try to, I think. And once again, if he wins... I think he has a chance to score really well, you know, and, 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 and the thing about Algio is he doesn't really get KO'd, which is almost a good thing. I mean, if he could find success, uh, feeling with the takedowns and all the stuff, he could score really well at 8,300. And I tell you this, this is what I was going to say. I haven't seen a single bit of content that really had a strong opinion on him. If anything, you heard some Algio speak, but the, the, the win conditions uh, story for Feely, it's not exactly the same. And it's not as as one-sided or whatever, as as something like the Gravely or the Robertson. 
but it's certainly a low owned variation of that. And I'm going to get way over the field on Andre Field. That's going to be my sneaky GPP stand of the day. Um, okay, two more fights here. Uh, you have Gregory Rodriguez against uh, Injukani. So the first thing I would be remiss if I did not point out is that there is some degree of uh, of, of of win equity here in uh, in Injukani. He's uh, steamed up to about a minus twenty favorite, and he's being priced as you know a very slight underdog. Right, it's like eighty two hundred eight k. It's not the biggest deal, but I, I I would point it out. Um, and then you look at this matchup. You have Enjokani. He has an inside the distance prop of, well, plus one ninety to win by TKO. That's and plus one seventy five to win inside the distance for his price. It's pretty good, <laughs> to say the least. And that's pretty good. And on the other hand, you have Gregory Rodriguez who's kind of like double trouble here. Like he not only has an inside the distance prop that's, you know, that's very reasonable. Um, that would be uh, plus 165. But not only that, he's got grappling upside. Um, if he decides or if he has the opportunity to turn this into a grappling match, he can really take it to Andrew Pani and rack up a huge score at a very reasonable price. So this is another one I really want to prioritize. I want to prioritize, well, I want to prioritize the fight, but I really want to be on this Rodriguez side. Now, again, will he go for takedowns? I don't know, but there's a certain chance that he will. And the only difference is, is that you have outs with him, even if he doesn't go the grappling route. Like, even if he doesn't go the grappling route, he does have finishing upside anyway. You know, so I think he's an extremely strong play to say the least. And in this fight, though, I would take the other side as well. So we get to the uh, the main event, and you have Sanhagen versus uh, Song. Um, I do have kind of an opinion on this fight from a DFS perspective. Um, I don't think that Sanhagen is a particularly good play. Um, he is minus one ninety. And he's got a very poor inside the distance, not poor. He's got a pretty fishy inside the distance prop. It's, it's, it's basically, uh, let's see. It's uh, Sanhagen wins inside the distance plus 250, which is really bad for that price. What he has going for him is the fact that he's got five rounds, right? Um, so he's got five rounds to work with that to, to maybe get that, that finish or to kind of rack up strikes. But I just have this feeling that that on a card like this, you're just going to need more than a volume striking decision in your lineup, um, even if you get five rounds to accomplish it at 9,200, okay, or 91, whatever it is. Um, I do believe that Sonya Dong is a very strong player. I mean, he's only, what, plus 170. And he's priced, now I guess, fair enough at 7K. I mean, maybe it should be a little bit more. But but the fact that it's a five-rounder, for him, it's going to matter more, I think. Um, because, well, I'll put it this way. I think he could win a, a, a high-volume striking affair. And, and for him, at 7,000, it does me a little bit of good. And I also believe that he has just as much finishing upside, if not more, than um than the favored Sanhagen. As a matter of fact, let me look through just to see if I'm I'm smoking here. Sanhagen wins by TKO plus 350. Song wins by TKO is about the same. You know? Um his inside the distance prop is very close to that of Sanhagen's, even though Sanhagen's a bigger favorite, you know, much bigger favorite. Because that's just the style. It's a style problem. So for me, um, I am less inclined. I, 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 if I, if I ran a crunch and I got no Sanhagen, it wouldn't bother me literally. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I think I will get to Sonya Dong. It's just you know seven K in five rounds. 
when there's a when there's it rates to you know he could get a finish, but he's he's going to be in the fight the whole time. I mean, he's not going to get clipped, um, so he always has a chance. Um, I I think that uh, I think he's the better side of this from a DFS perspective. So I guess to summarize, let me just kind of review my my kind of key plays here on the slate. Um, they all. Well, most of them have just really good grappling win conditions. You know, you got Jillian, J- Jillian Anderson, you got Jillian Robertson, you have uh, Tony Gravely, you have uh, Anthony Hernandez, you have Andre Feely, and then I gave you another underdog that kind of like a money line underdog play, and that's um, Cameron Van Camp, and I-, I like those more than the favorites. You know, the bigger favorites. I think of the favorites I like. I like the. I'll pay the ninety seven hundred for what's his name, for 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 I forget his name. The, the, the ninety four seven hundred guy, and then I, I you know I can play some Giles. Why not a little bit? Giles is fine, and and Sabatini with his wrestling upside is fine. But I don't think I need to play Moda. I don't think I need to play Jurov, whatever his name was. I don't, I don't need to play Basharat. You know he's a little cheaper, but. I don't know. I I, I think and and I, and I and the Hernandez and what's the Rodriguez very strong play. So I'm going to be taking stands with those guys, and and you'll see a bunch of those in my lineups. I think. Um, you know, look, we got to wait see maybe there's another fight that disappears, whatever it is. But um, I, I really like this card. You have to take stands somewhere. I think I've been very clear about where I'm taking them, and hopefully a couple of them win. Uh, Good luck, everybody, uh, uh, on tomorrow's card.